Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the second director's Q&A session of the Taiwan Post New Wave Cinema Series. I'm Zhang Biyu, the Deputy Director of the Center of Taiwan Studies. This year marks the uh, center's uh, 20th anniversary. This series is part of our celebration of this memorable year. The Taiwan Post New Wave Cinema Series aims to investigate Taiwan's cinematic landscape of the past 30 years. In contrast to a significant amount of research undertaken on Taiwan New Wave and the important auteur such as Liu Xiaoxian, Edward Yang, Tai Mingliang, Li An, um, little academic attention has been given to what has followed. Our focus is to map this long overdue and old, uh, long overlooked cinematic landscape, examining the aesthetics of new film from Taiwan, and it contextualized the post new wave generation directors and their films. It is our pleasure to welcome director Lin Shuyu today, one of the most important of the younger generation of filmmakers. May I ask you to switch on your microphone and put your hands together. Hold on, let me highlight him <laughs> and uh, welcome him. Oh, thank you. Okay, I will come back to you again because um, I will introduce him uh, briefly and let you ask all the interesting questions. So, okay. Well, as you know, we have shown some of Director Ling's uh, most important films this week, starting uh, from his first short film, The Pain of Others, which won a Golden Harvest Award for Outstanding Short Films in 2005. We also screen his feature film, Winds of September 2008, Starry Starry Night 2011, and Vinya Flower, 2015. These films have not only won him prestigious award domestically and internationally, but also have built his reputation as a sophisticated and versatile filmmaker and scriptwriter. He is a real master of storytelling, uh, and his film, his films are sleek, beautiful dramatic with striking visual. Before we start the Q&A session, I would like to thank our funder, the Ministry of Culture Taiwan, the Cultural Division at the Taipei Representative Office in the UK, and also the Taiwan Film Institute for their support. Without their generous funding and continuous backing, it would not have been possible to launch such a an ambitious project. Please be aware, this session is recorded. I would appreciate it if you could turn off your audio and video functions so to enhance the uh, quality of the session. To ask questions, as we have done uh, in the past uh, few days, please post them in the chat column and please refrain from irrelevant topics, okay? As usual, <coughs> could you <coughs> pose only one question at a time and keep them succinct? Our assistant curator, Shao Yi, will collate them and present them to Director Lin. To start the Q&A session, Director Lin will say a few words first. Um, so, Shu Yu, right. <coughs> yes. it's up over to you. Oh. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm sorry, just <clears throat> had some something in my throat. Um, yeah, um, well, uh, uh, thank you all for um, being here. Um, and I, you know, I like to thank you guys for, for hosting this, for um, shining a spotlight on, well, you know, I, I never thought of myself as any kind of wave or anything like that. <laughs> um, so it, I mean, it's 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 fun to you know to to hear that. Okay, well, I guess I am part of 
a post new wave. Um, and just the fact that um, the other directors that are also highlighted in this um, <clears throat> in this season um, are also good friends of mine. Mm. And uh, we've known each other for a long time. Um, one which, of course, Zheng uh, Youjie, which we've worked together on many projects together. Um, so, yeah, so it's, it's great to, um, to, I guess, be acknowledged. Uh, for our work, um, and um, you know, I'm here to, you know, I guess answer any questions anybody would have, um, and I'm and I'm sure a lot of the questions that you guys may ask probably will shed a light on how I actually see myself because I don't really, you know, I'm not that introspective. Um, I'm you 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 make a film, you you put everything you have into it. And you give it to the world, and then you move on. You know, you move on to the next project. You move on to the next story. Um, I, I I seldom really look back at what I've done before. I know what I've done while I've been while I was doing it. I've watched it hundreds of times. I, you know, and so um, so yeah, I'm 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 very excited to do this. Um, it's, uh, it's a it's a it's a great chance to do this, and. Um, at, <clears throat> I guess before we begin, I like to share like a small story of <clears throat> of when we were in. I think our I think it was our late twenties, early thirties, somewhere around there. Uh, no, probably in the thirties. Yeah, because both Yo Jie and I we've made our first feature film, and um, so we've been working in the industry for a while. Um, and we both have a feature film under our belt. And um, so one day we were sitting in the coffee shop one afternoon, you know, um, just chatting and, and, and we, didn't, we didn't know what we were gonna do next. We didn't know what our next project was gonna be or where the funding's gonna come from or anything. And uh, we started talking about um, like, it wasn't, we weren't talking about a wave, but we were talking about like being in a film circle. Mm. Um, we, 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 we seldom, we all, we always call it like, mm. right? Like a film circle. And, um, and when we when in our twenties, when we, when we mentioned a film circle, it was always the, the, the other guys. It was all the other filmmakers that came ahead of us. Um, you know, in our early 20s, when we talk about the ancient, of course, we were mentioning uh, masters such as Ho Xiao Shen and Edward Yang and um, Tsai Ming Liang, Ang Li. And, and then you have uh, another generation that's a little bit younger than them, um, where you have like Yi Ziyan and Chen Yuxing, um, who's about a decade older than us. So we were talking and then we were like, it was weird because we were just because our lives haven't really changed not 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 that much we're still struggling filmmakers even though we have a film and and we still you know hang out at coffee shops and we're still eating the same thing dressed the same way and we were talking and then i asked him and i said hey where you know are 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 we are we in the circle now you know are we, are we <laughs> Like, do we do we feel like we're in a circle now? Do we feel like we're in the film circle? And um, and he was thinking about it. It's like, I don't know. It, I didn't. Like, nothing really changed. Are we in a, a circle? And um, but then the more we thought about it, it kind of occurred to us like, well, the circle is what we make of it. And and. And what we actually do, um, the work that we do. Um, so there's like not a real circle, but then the circle comes from just putting in the work, just just doing more work, just making more films, just building a body of work, and 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 then you know and having a reputation of of hopefully making good films, and. And with that, you know, it just it, it kind of forms um, a circle, or it kind of forms a unity of, of some sort. 
and because you know we grew up in the same era era we 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 were influenced by the same things we were seeing our we were seeing you know our surroundings um and reflecting upon them and um and at the same time we were of course very aware of all the other filmmakers our age and what they were coming with were coming up with um what they were shooting and then that stimulates us to do more um i remember when uh arvin arvin chen came back from the states he made uh ye taipei of our taipei um and like you know i've never seen taipei shot like that and uh and i was i was i was jealous in a, a little bit and i was like wow that looks so great you know you did a really great job of shooting taipei of making taipei look romantic and everything i i really wanted to do that I'd never done that before and uh yeah so we were like bouncing off each other um so yeah i i guess that's kind of how i mean i don't know if there were there were waves um because it also comes with the audience but um but but you know we did feel that you know we had our own circle of filmmaker friends and we were supporting each other and we were giving each other advice uh we were um uh we were supporting each other in a way where you know like no when nobody believed in our work you know we still had each other mm -hmm. and we could still look at each other's work and say no no you 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 know you you're doing fine it's okay keep on going you know um so so yeah yeah um i don't know if all that added up qualifies as a post new wave but um, <laughs> but but yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, i'm sorry to interrupt in in the, in the flow no 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 i was i was pretty much done anyway <laughs> oh great actually i i have to say um it is so funny because I, this is the first question I was going to ask you. Oh. Uh, it is so funny because I noticed Jing Yu Jie appeared in several of the films, right? Yeah. And it seems <laughs> <Yeah>. that, <laughs> um, and also in, uh, I read about it that uh, other directors also in, got involved in uh, Zinnia Flower, for example, Niu Cheng Zhe and the Dai Li Ren. Um, involved in the editing process. Yes, yes, so yes. So this really reminds me of the camaraderie among the new wave directors, you know, between the Hou Xiaoxian, Yang Dechang, uh, Wan Ren, Ke Yi Zheng, they all play in each other's films, they all help each other, if, if, and so on. So uh, my question originally was asking you, in your opinion, do you, uh, do you also have a similar relationship with not just Zheng Yu Jie, but also other uh, filmmakers? And also, how does that sort of relationship help you in your artistic uh, pursuit as a director? Um, yeah, uh, other directors also, you know, we're, we probably don't work on each other's films, but we watch each other's films while, we're, while it's being done. And we give each other critique. Um, I remember that, um, Yang Yazhe was editing. We were, we actually shot our first feature um, probably all around the same time. We were shooting in the same summer. We were editing. Um, we were editing in the same place too. We were editing at Zhongying, of all places. <laughs> um, you know, Zhongying. That's where all all these yes. little guys came from. Yes. And we were there. We were ed we were there editing with. Um, the two senior editors that were at Zhongying. One was uh, Lei Zhenqing, who edited uh, Yang Yazhe's first film, Jiong Nan Hai. And then my editor was Chen Xiaodong. Um, uh, he, he, we, we did Winds of September. And we were, we were literally just room by room. We were just like, our two rooms were together. Um, and um, we would be editing in the daytime at lunchtime, we would have lunch together, like every, all of us would have lunch together. And then in the afternoon, we go back to our, our rooms and edit. And then when I got bored in my room, I go to his room. And when he got bored in his room, he come to my room <laughs> and then look at what we've done. And, and then like, oh, okay, that's a nice shot. Oh, okay, that looks cool. Um, 
And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it did feel very, there was a very, uh, there was a closeness. Mm. Um, and, um, and I guess also for me, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm a, a, a little different just because I also do a lot of, um, first assistant director work. Mm. Yes. And so I have a different kind of relationship with a lot of directors because I, you know, I work with mm. them or, you know, I work for them, you could say, mm. um, so, you know, uh, starting with uh, Chen Wen Tang, and, uh, and then I was assistant director for Tai Ming Liang on uh, Wayward Cloud, and uh, Zhou Mei Ling, Zhen Yu Jie, Niu Chen Zhe. And uh, so, I, yeah, I've worked with all these directors before, and, um, and I learned from them, and then we become friends. Um, and, and I guess it's a personality thing, but then I'm not... Um, I'm not shy about asking for favors. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, yeah, please help me. You know, <laughs> like, come, come help me. Um, especially for Xenia Flower. Um, uh, they were very grateful. I mean, I, I, I was very grateful for, for, for them um, because they were so gracious with their time. Uh, I had a, like a pre-screening session for a bunch of my director friends. So Niu Chenzhe came, uh, Dai Li Ren, uh, Yi Zhiyan, Dao Yan, a, a lot of these are my director's friends. They all came and they watched the film. It was like a, it's like a not a rough edit, but then it was a, quite a long edit. Um, so they watched it and <clears throat> they were giving me advice. Um, and then it was Niu Chenzhe who first uh, suggested that, you know, like well, besides giving advice, maybe he'll just he'll just work with my editor, and then he'll come with a version, and then he'll he said, you know, I could try and cut something, and you could see what you can take from that. Um, and again, I think this is this all comes down to our tradition, um, because this also came when uh, Neil Tenza he was he was about to finish, uh, oh no, or, or has he already finished uh, Jun Zhong Le Yuan, mm. which I don't know if a lot of people knew uh, about the editing process of Jun Zhong Le Yuan because it was the same thing, that he shot the film, he edited it, and then he had a version, and then he showed it to Hou Xiaoxian. <laughs> He showed it to Hou Xiaoxian and asked him, like, what do you think? And Hou Xiaoxian said, you know, I'll, I'll edit a version. You know, I'll just give me a week or two weeks. So Hou Xiaoxian ah. actually, yeah, Hou Xiaoxian actually came to the office. <clears throat> I remember because I was first assistant for Jin Zong Liu Yuan. Um, so Hou Xiaoxian actually came to the office every day from morning to night um, with uh, the uh, with the editor, without Niu Chenzhe, just with the editor, and he edited another version of Jin Zhong Le Yuan. You mean the whole film? The whole film, the whole film. He, I mean, he was he was working from you know the the Niu Chenzhe cut, but then he was taking out things, putting in new things. It wasn't just like giving little advices. It was actually going into the bin. It was going in. It was like so. Let me look at another take. It was kind of like that. It was like, let's see another take. Let's see what we have. Let's see what we have in the bin. And it was editing that way. And, um, <clears throat> and so after he finished that, he showed it to Niu Zhenzhe. He said, you know, this is my suggestion. Um, take what you can from it. You know, your version's still there. It's not like, you know, it's not there anymore. Take what you can and see what you like and, and, and you could figure it out. And so I think like going through that and then me asking Niu Zhenzhe to like watch my film, he suggested that he would, he could do the same thing. So he, he sat down with my editor. He told me to go home. He said, don't sit there, you know, said, like, go home. So he told me to go home and then he actually worked on a version with, with, with my editor for a week. He came out with a version. I watched it and it stimulated me. It gave me more, um, it gave me more ideas, and uh, and then with 
uh, Tai Di Ren, it was because he's great at at looking at acting. Um, <clears throat> and because for me, uh, my main actor, uh, Shi Jinghang, Shi Tou, because he's a musician, he's not like a professional actor, he's a guitarist for a big rock band in Taiwan. Um, <clears throat> So he had, you know, problems in his editing, uh, in his performance that needs some editing. <clears throat> um, but I couldn't tell anymore because I, I've watched this so many times, I was kind of numb. Um, so I didn't really know how to help the performance because I was like, well, it all looks good. And then, <laughs> you know, I was like, it looks good to me. What's wrong with it? And then people would be like, no, no, there's something wrong. And so, and, and I was kind of like blinded already because I've watched it so many times. And so I asked Tai Di Ren if he could come in and help me with that, with his performance, with, with um, Shi, mm. Shi Jinghang's performance and see the stuff that, okay, this is not a good take. Okay, this is not a good performance. We need to edit around this. We need to go find another way to, 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 to show it, things like that. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I've, I've been fortunate to have, you know, the help of all these people and, um, and it's, it's nice when, um, it's nice when people are selfless. Um, and, and like I said, it passes down. Um, it passes down how, you know, Ho Dao helped. You know, Shen Zhe, and then he would come and help me. And this is like, you know, nobody's paying anybody to do this. This is just people offering to do it. Um, because there's, you know, there's very little money in Taiwanese cinema. Um, <laughs> and um, and it, it really gives, you know, our generation of filmmakers, if we've gone through this, if people have been this way for us, we do it for others too. We do it for our friends. We do it for the younger filmmakers that is that that is coming, um, that is making films now. Um, I'm in the process of producing a, a feature film for a young director right now, um, and it started the same way, kind of, because we we met at some festival. They asked, she asked me if I could read her script. I read it. I gave her some comments, and then it kind of snowballed from there. And then now I'm her, I'm her EP, you know, and then. And and the thing is going. We we have the money and everything like that. And you know, however we can help. Um, so so yeah yeah it, it's yeah it, it, yeah I, I, it's a it's like a mutual help. We we do that a lot. You know? It's a um, fascinating theme because it it seemed to have a similar sort of uh, really uh, comradeship there. Yeah 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 there is it there, there is a, a, a comradeship. Um, because it is a very small community of filmmakers. Um, yeah. Your cats are the background. You mm -hmm. Your cat. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, hey. Okay. Um, I think I actually got another question, but I, I can see quite a, already I can see the accumulation of questions. So okay. I, I'll hand it to uh, Xiao Yi. Xiao okay. Yi, would you? My take up the first question, please. Um, yeah, very, that's great. I think um, the first question actually comes from Max. Um, so, yes. um, mm -hmm. right, so um, in your experience, um, mm -hmm. have film companies or um, directors, etc., you've collaborated with from outside of Taiwan um, seen themselves as contributing to um, this kind of Post new wave cinema by working with you on on projects. Um, have there been any instances where people have actively tried to tie or distance themselves to this? Yeah, I think that that's the question. Oh, okay. Well, that's a that's a very interesting question. Um, well, I don't know if they particularly saw it as a a, a post new wave. But um, but of course there has been uh, um, collaborators that came to Taiwan because of the new wave cinema, because of their um, because of their familiarity with um, with their works, with Ho Xiaoxian's work or Edward Yang's work, and that's where they knew Taiwan. Then then they want to know more about Taiwanese cinema, 
and they come here, they find us. Um, so, you know, say for example, my, my, my DP, my, my director of photography, Jake, uh, Jake Polak is from the United States. Um, mm -hmm. when he first came to Taiwan, you know, he was shooting commercials. Um, one big, uh, reason why he came was while his friend was here, Weeding, Weeding Ho, uh, a Malaysian filmmaker, he was working in Taiwan. Um, and, but another thing was, um, you know, Taiwanese cinema, he was familiar with Taiwanese cinema and he wanted to, 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 to work in this industry. He wanted to find out more about the culture and uh am to work here um i think it goes the same with collaborators that i've worked with in malaysia too and i guess also because malaysia is very familiar with um the taiwanese uh new wave um so uh especially like i guess my like my editor uh my malaysian mm -hmm. editor um his name is asu um he's also the editor for uh ho yuhan um, I'm sure a lot of people here might be familiar with Johan. He's a Malaysian filmmaker, very great filmmaker. Um, and um, and so like with Asu, he's, a, he's, he's 10 years younger. And he actually does see me and like, like you know, uh, Yaza or Yoja. He actually does see us as a certain wave, I, I guess. Mm. Um, and he... When, when he's editing my film, he asks me a lot about my generation of filmmakers, what we've been doing and the films and the work that we do. Um, so, so I guess, yeah, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, now that Max asked this question. Yeah. Thank you, Max. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's very interesting. I mean, it's, it's really different when, when you're, but like you said, you're inside the circle, but you don't know if you're actually constituting a kind of um, a, a wave, another wave or, or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's actually very interesting because last week it was um, Gu Jiran da, da mm. Q&A. Okay. And oh. um, it, it's very interesting. I mean, um, he did have his own um interpretation of of this generation if if i understand him correctly um, uh -huh. what, what was his <laughs> like in a nutshell what was his interpretation is that is that possible uh, to, to, to nutshell um, it? yeah i mean um i guess what he he thinks of your generation or his generation is that um um your filmmaking actually constitutes a kind of um response to the new wave uh, masters like, oh yes, of um, course. I I totally agree. Yeah, and um, so um, when we a lot of people are talking about the new wave um filmmakers, um, they often understand their films as a more kind of politicized um or or cinema that tries to tie in more with the social political background. But whereas the new generation, younger generation of filmmakers, would have a kind of response or a kind of rebellion by trying to distance from the political cinema. But um, but of course, so Ho Jian and Dao Yan also think things take a change after um, 2010. And after that, um, many of the younger filmmakers start to make more politicized cin uh, films as well. So yeah, that's that's a nutshell. If you OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 I totally agree. It, we 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 are we are very responsive of what has come before, and we're heavily influenced. Um, I think consciously and subconsciously, we're we're heavily influenced. Um, I mean, we're so influenced, I think, by that generation's filmmaking um, that it it even um, it even affects how we direct actors, how we choose our actors, um, the way that we use non-actors, um, sometimes non-actors over movie stars. Um, a lot of that is still very heavily influenced by what they do, what, what they did, yeah. Mm. Do, you, do you think there's a, um, um, you think there's a feature or something that characterized your generation or you think it's, it's 
it's not a thing. There isn't a really central element that that um, yeah bring you all together. I think one thing that 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 is a bit more apparent with my generation of filmmakers is our um, is our balancing of of um, com the commercial aspect of our films and, and uh, the artistic side of it. I think we're for good or for bad, a lot of our films are caught in the middle. Um, I don't think we are as daring in a way um, as some of the filmmakers that came before us. Um, the way we deal with um, money um, and um, the, the, the way we deal with our box, how we face box office, um, it, it has affected um, our generation, I think. Um, but we still, I think the heavily influenced part is the part where we, what we learned as a film student, what we learned as a cinephile, what we've been told are quote unquote important films, you know, so-called mm -hmm. important films. These are serious films, you know, like this is what we should be uh, striving for. Um, that still has a heavy influence on our generation of filmmakers, where uh, filmmakers like 10, 15 years younger than me, they, they actually don't have that. They didn't grow up watching Ho Xiao Shen films. They know uh -huh. of him, but, but they didn't grow up watching them. They didn't grow up watching, you know, Edward Yang movies, you know. I mean, I, I grew up in the era where, you know, A Brighter Summer Day was in theaters. Um, mm. You know, uh, a confusion, a confusion. You know, a confusion, confusion. Mahjong. Uh, I, I watched all these in movie theaters. You know, these were these were movies that I went to the theaters to see. Um, the the filmmakers that are younger than us, they probably I don't know. They probably watched our films. You know, <laughs> they, they they watched uh, Winds of September. They watched Do Over. They watched Nan Fang Xiao Yang Mu Chang. Um, they watched our films. Um, but they're not as influenced by, by the realism, by, um, our balance of what we think is important. Uh, um, now you most, I mean, now, like I would say, I think, I think about six to seven of, out of 10 movies that are coming out in Taiwan now are, are genre films, mm. are, are wow. thriller film or thriller or action or mm -hmm. suspense horror, um, yeah, comedy. Um, yeah, now they, they don't have that thing anymore. And then they're like, yeah, we just, we just make what we want to make. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, mm. um, okay, yeah, I think I will um, think our audience, Kavan, has okay. a lot of questions. So I shouldn't okay. keep sure. him from... Um, Asking those, so um, so I think he's very very interested in in Starry Starry Night, and um, mm -hmm. so he would love to know um, who did the dream sequence um of the train before before it comes into the station and flying through the the starry starry sky. So yeah, is 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 it someone who you always work um often work with, or yeah? Oh. Um, the, the dream sequence, um, well, I mean, I, I worked with, uh, a, a, a CG company in Beijing, um, to do that, to do all the sequences, all, all the animation sequences in Starry Starry Night. Um, but those ideas were more, there were, the, the ideas were more pulled from, um, the, the source, the source material. Um, Starry Starry Night is based on an illustration book by yes. a very famous illustrator called Jimmy Liao. And, um, and in his book, um, it's, it suggests a lot of these things. Um, I remember the picture of the train by night, uh, a picture. It had a picture. It, it was a picture of, of a, a moving train at night 
and with starry skies on top. And it had the little boy and the little girl standing on the train while it was moving. That was the picture. That was the picture drawn. And it had a surrealism to it. Like, you know, how could two kids stand on the train, right, while it's going? So it had that beautiful thing about it. And with that picture, I imagine uh, a flying train. I imagine a train flying through the starry, starry night. And so mm -hmm. when I came up with that idea, I went to our art designers um, in the CG department. And I yeah. asked them, like, you know, how, like, you know, like uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night, can we make that into an animation? How and how? How would it look like if we were actually in it, if we were actually in that painting? Um, but mm -hmm. it's CG, you know. How do we make that? You know, how how would that, that look? So it was kind of like that, and then it all came from there. Um, and um, kudos to the CG team because we had a like a very tight deadline for that movie, and they were working day and night. Um, it was it was crazy how, you know, I, I'm sure we broke a lot of labor laws um, uh, um, doing the CG for Starry Starry Night. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So it was, it was with a, a, a Beijing um, CG company. Mm, that's yeah. very interesting. Um, and um, Kivan is also curious about um, the the opening sequence of, of Starry Starry Night, which which is set in a train station. Um, mm -hmm, so what made mm -hmm. you decide to to open the film in the train station? Yep. Um, that's a good question. I I don't remember. <laughs> I I honestly don't remember um, why I opened the film that way. Um, I, I remember the scene. Um, yes, I, I'm sorry. This, <laughs> this is so long ago. Uh, this was uh, what 2011, I think. So that was like I, I probably wrote it in 2009 or 2010. So those are the decade ago. Um, ah, I don't. I don't remember. Oh no! Wait, no. I opened the scene. Oh, it, it was a very logical choice. I, I opened the scene um, with the girl wanting to run away for the first time. Um, I wanted to establish that right in the beginning, that that she oh. wanted to run away for the very first time. She, wa she went to the train station. She wanted to go see her grandfather, but she chickened out. Um, uh. and, the sad thing, and the sad thing about that big first big sequence for me was when she actually got home from not running away, her parents right. didn't. Even, her parents didn't even know that she was gone. Like her parents didn't even care, and um, and so that yeah yeah I, I opened it that way. I was it was a little sequence. Um, uh, yeah yeah I remember that now. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, I think it's very interesting because um, particularly we we have received several feedback from audiences and they are all um, they're all particularly drawn to Starry Starry Night. Of course, oh. I think not all of your films are, 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 are great, but I think for some reason there's something in Starry Starry Night that speaks to our audience. But, oh, that's, yeah, that's, think, that's nice. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think, film is also quite different from the rest of your work because I think it it's is. the only fantasy work that you put a fantasy a little with with a lot of fantastical elements that is yeah in your yeah audio and and it's not um it's the first film of mine that um I mean I wrote it but then I wrote it based it was an adaptation um all my other films Excluding my last one, the Malaysian one, but then all my other ones, the the Pain of Others, Winds of September, and Zinnia Flower, they all have uh, bi autobiographical parts to it. They're all coming from me. They're all coming from my life and what I've gone through. Um, except for yeah, except for Starry Starry Night, yeah. But yeah, which is which was it's a weird movie. <laughs> it's, it's, 
weird to call my film a weird movie. I'm, I mean, it's, it's, it's weird for me because when it's, it was odd because when I finished the film, um, I don't know if because it was very rushed. Like I said, it was a Taiwan China co production and we had a, we had a Chinese release date. And, um, and so it was very rushed. And I remember very clearly that emotion of when I finished that film, I was actually not very pleased with the end result. Um, I felt like I didn't do enough or I felt like I didn't do more. I felt there was more I could have done. And um, when I first finished, I could say it now. I couldn't say it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, I was promoting it. So I had to say it was great. Um, so yeah, so when I, when I, when I finished it, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't very pleased with it. I was, I, 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 I kind of didn't really like it. Um, I was proud of it. I mean, it's still, you know, we, we put in the work, it looked beautiful. Um, but for me, there was like, oh, I don't know. But then I remember about like five years later after the film came out, um, they had an outdoor screening um, um, in Taipei. I think it was like a part of a, the Taipei Film Festival thing. And they had an outdoor screening and it was in the summer. Um, and they showed it on a, on a big lawn and hundreds of people showed up to watch the film. And I haven't seen it in a couple of years. So I figured, you know, yeah, I'll go, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go sit in the back and then I'll, I'll watch it again. I haven't seen it for a while. And I was, I was quite taken by the film, to, to be honest. I was like, I, there, were, there were parts of it because I haven't seen it for a while. There were parts of it I forgot that I did. And then I watched a certain sequence and then I was like, wow, that's mm. actually a nice sequence. That's actually, um, and uh, yeah. And then the, from, and the reaction of the audience, um, because it was an outdoor screening. So there was a lot of families, a lot of parents brought their children to watch the movie. And um, yeah, it was it was um, a quite pleasant experience um, revisiting that film that that you know um, when I finished it I thought it wasn't good but after the fact like no it's it's actually it's okay it's it's a decent movie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think um, the next question is also about Star Star and Night, which is from yeah, our um, sure. guest Dr. Chris. Brown, who who will be giving a talk next week. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, Brown is asking about the forest scenes in Starry Starry Night. Um, wow. So you use mm -hmm. some really interesting locations around Ali Shan, um, mm, yes. like yeah. the railway um, mm -hmm. with the landslide. Um, could you tell us about why you chose these locations and what it, what it was like filming there? Right, thank you. Oh, um, oh, thank you for that question. Huh? Um, well, um, Ali Shan, um, the, the railways and everything were, it, it, I mean, we didn't write it um, like that. It, that came from scouting. Um, when we went up to the mountains and we started scouting locations, we found these, um, these, these great places. Um, before shooting, uh, there was a big typhoon and there were landslides, there were mudslides. And then we, we had these tracks that were hanging there, um, and they haven't come and fixed it yet. And, um, and when you see something like that, you're like, oh no, we gotta, we, you know, like we gotta document this. We gotta, we gotta shoot it. We gotta put this on celluloid. Um, so a lot of it came from that. A lot of it came from. Um, seeing um, these great locations. Uh, oh, there's a feedback. I'm sorry. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of it came from seeing these great locations and um, and and working the script around it. Um, I remember that the second half of the script where the children are lost in the forest, we had some setups, but then we we intentionally kept it loose. Also, just because um, when you're in the Ali Mountains, um, you never really know what kind of weather you're going to get. 
-hmm. it could be raining one one minute and it could be sunny the next and then it could be misty another and um and a lot of it was just coming out of what what um what opportune gave us what god was presenting us mm. um it, we, i really felt um because and we, also because when we had a very tight schedule we knew we were going to shoot in alisa and we had we built a little cabin there but oh. um everything around it um a lot of stuff when we were going here and there and they're they're lost they're going in circles and stuff like that um right. a lot of that was in a way it was improvised it was you know me working on the script that the, the previous night and then like well the next day let's go shoot this or let's go shoot that um there's one sequence i remember in the in in, in the in the forest mm -hmm. where the two of them are just walking in the yeah. mist for a while and it was like two close ups and they're just walking and walking and walking Yeah. We did that just because the fog just came and then they couldn't let us shoot. It was so foggy. Oh. It was so foggy that we couldn't shoot anything. Um we couldn't see anything. So mm -hmm. I figured, well, if we can't see anything, can can I I asked my DP, well, can we see something that's, you know, like five feet away from us? Yeah, that we could see. So I go, well, let's put a really long track and let's just shoot the two kids walking. Mm -hmm. Um and it'll be close up enough and then we could, that we could see them and they'll be in the mist and and we'll do that and we'll see we'll see how I I'll work that into the 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 film um in the editing you know and then we shot that um so yeah a lot of it was 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 like that it was like we found this and then it's like that let's do it um another thing about Ali Mountain is that it could it you know one side you could go to it and then like one side of the mountain could look um rural enough but then then you know you turn around 180 degrees and there might be a road and yeah. so it's it's easier access so there's still that there's still the fact that we needed a mountain where it could look reclusive but at the same time you know easy access so that's why we we chose uh, out the Ali mountain Oh, wow. Right. That's very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Um so our next question is from our audience um Sin Yang. Um so this question is about Winds of September. So mm -hmm. uh, in that film, um each of the teenagers had had a very strong and vivid personality for them and mm -hmm. and they did a very good job in 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 their performance. Yeah. Um yeah. So um so um the audience is wondering how how you cast these actors. I know you said you you you, you chose mostly non-actors as in your films. Um since in the new wave cinema, um yeah, uh, like it ties in with the new wave cinema where the directors usually used amateurs in their films. Um does it kind of influence you on choosing the actors? Right, thank you. Yeah. Um uh, uh thank you Sing Yang for this question. Um Winds of September for me um i don't know how other people see it but winds of september for me is like my most my most taiwan new wave film you know if if, the, if there's <laughs> yes. a definition if there's a definition of taiwan new wave that's my taiwan new wave movie oh. um it, or i i i always i i actually think of it as my homage to the taiwan mm. new wave um and i kind of shot it that way too um the realism of it the actors Um we did uh for the for Winds of September we did a very wide casting call and I knew that um I didn't want um like movie stars or I didn't mm. want like pop icons yeah. I wanted real teenagers mm. um I wanted people who were in in that age you know I don't want to yeah. see and I think this is again this is from the the, the tradition of the Taiwanese new wave You know, I didn't feel like it was right to see like 25-year-olds or or 28-year-olds play high school kids. I didn't want that. Um so, yeah, so you know, we were we were looking everywhere. I mean, there were casting agencies that had young kids. Uh they were mostly amateurs. Um some of them maybe they've done a few commercials. Um one kid was, you know, one one of the nine kids 
I actually found in a supermarket. He was just a high school kid. Um, <laughs> He was he was he was in a supermarket like uh, buying face cream or something, <laughs> and he was like he was like you know um, he was joking around with his friends and I saw him and I was like wow that that's a great looking kid, um, and I asked him you know I went up to him and I asked him like you know I'm a film director I'm getting ready to do a movie would you like to come and audition, and. Um, and yeah, so the guy, the kid took my card, very uh, skeptical of me. <laughs> um, he took my card, and a week later, he actually, he finally called. Oh, wow. He finally called, and he said that, you know, he looked me up on the internet. I look <laughs> legit. And, and he'll come to the audition. He's the, 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 the fat kid. Oh. He's the chubby kid. So he's, he's actually, he's not an actor at all. Um, and he has nothing to do with like no commercials, no anything. He had like no prior experience of filmmaking oh. whatsoever. It's very um, interesting because I looked him up after watching the film, and I don't think he has any other work or just not not that I know of. <laughs> no, no, he just that was it. That was it for him. For that one summer, he did a movie, and we're still great friends. And you know, we we still have gatherings and stuff. He's he's in insurance now. <laughs> and um, and and I think he actually does insurance for a couple of the other actors in the film. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, so and you know, yeah, yeah, we still you know we we still hang out. And uh, yeah, so that was kind of how we were casting uh, Winds of September. Um, our main uh, protagonist, I met him uh, through uh, Tai Ming Liang's films. Oh, uh, Zhang Jie. Zhang Jie yeah. was the, he was the star. Uh, he was the main actor for Li Kangsen's uh, Bu Jian. Oh, and um, and I did the um, um, I didn't work on Bu Jian Bu San, but I did the subtitle English translation for those two films. Um, <laughs> that was my first encounter with Tsai Ming Liang. And um, yeah, so I met them and then I saw Zhang Jie and uh, liked the kid a lot. I put him in my first short. He was, yeah. he was the, the rookie in uh, The Pain of Others. Um, and then I figured, yo, I'll just keep on working with him. So it was kind of like that. I had Zhang Jie and then everything was building around that. Mm. Um, I think Zhang Jie at the time, he was 17 or 18, oh. if yeah. I remember correctly. Um, none of the kids, I mean, the oldest kid in that group was like 19. That's, that's, yeah. you know, that's where I was willing to go. Like 19. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 19. Yeah. So you're, I mean, you know, um, processes change, you know, nowadays, you know, if you ask me, would I be willing to like take a 23 year old and shoot a high school movie? I go, yeah, you know, why not? But then at that time I was like very, at that time I was very adamant, you know, I was like, no, no. nobody. And, um, and one, I mean, I have to do one shout out to our producer, uh, Zhen Ziwei. Um, he's, um, <clears throat> of course, a lot of people know him. Uh, yeah. He's a Hong Kong filmmaker, actor. Mm -hmm. um, he's the, he's the, you know, um, he's the bad guy in Infernal Affairs. Everybody knows him. <laughs> so <clears throat> what was great about Zhen Ziwei was that he was okay with us choosing newcomers, all nine. Um, because for him, he had a way of packaging this. Or in his mind, he had a way of packaging this. Because with yeah. Winds of September, what Zen Zui did was he took my script and he gave it to two young filmmakers, uh, one in Hong Kong and one in mainland China. Right, Mai Xi Ying. Yeah, Mai Xing and Han Yan. Um, yeah. So they got, oh, they also got my script and then they adapted my script into their own screenplay um, with seven boys and two girls. And they wrote their own coming of age movie. Um, and so um, we never got to do it, but then uh, Zhen Ziwei, um, Eric Tang, he, the, his great idea was that what he saw was like on a cover of a magazine would be a long photo out. And on that photo out, 
would be 27 new actors, mm -hmm. three new directors, oh. and him sitting in the middle, a godfather. <laughs> you know, that's what he saw. He saw him in the middle as the godfather, three young directors behind him, and 27 <laughs> new actors. And this is his family. That's what he wanted to do. So, I mean, kudos to him. He had a vision that he wanted to pursue. And then he's like, yeah, go ahead. Go, you know, find your perfect cast. Find newcomers. It's fine. It's okay. Just do this. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, I wasn't, I was very lucky. They didn't force me to use pop icons. They didn't force me to use, like, the hottest new kid around or anything like that. I, you know, yeah, Winds of September. We got our casting. We got very lucky. Yeah. You know. Oh. Right. So, oh, so it actually all three films started with your with your script. Yes, all three films started with Winds of September, um, and this goes back to again. This goes back to like everything's connected. Let's go back to Zhen Youjie too, because <laughs> Youjie's wife um, is very good friends with Zhen Ziwei's daughter. Daughter. <laughs> and. So Yoji's wife knew that I was having trouble financing with the September. And so he asked um, Senzue's daughter, like, would she want to read my script? She oh. read the script, like Zen Baoyi read the script, and she liked it. And she said that, you know what? I think my dad will love it. Oh. So, so she gave the script to her father, and uh, Eric Zhang read it. He loved it. And he wanted to produce it. And he, at the same time, he asked me, he said, I want to produce it, but I also want to take the rights of this script and then give it to two other directors. Are oh. you okay with that? And I oh. said, you know, that's fine. That's, of course, that's, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. So, yeah. So that was Mai Xi's first film. And that was Han Yin's first film, which, oh, which sadly was banned um, by uh, the Chinese authority. Um, but the Hain Yin uh, version of Winds of September is excellent. I loved it. Um, oh, wow. Not a lot of people saw it just because it never made it um, theatrically. I got to see like uh, a close to finished version in Hong Kong. It was great. It's, it's yeah, it's a really good movie. Yeah. Oh, so it did get released in Hong Kong. It didn't. It didn't. I saw it oh. in Hong Kong because I was in. Uh, Eric Zen's office, and oh. he showed it to me. Oh, that's that's. It was sad. never it was never released anywhere. I don't. I mean, I know Han Yin probably has a copy of it, um, but yeah, but he's I, he's not allowed to release it. You know? Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think Kavan has another question about um, Winds of September. So yeah, it's it's just that w was it autobiographical? It was. Oh, it right. was autobiographical. Um, the screenplay started out um, from, it was one year, um, Chinese New Year's, I, I went back home to my hometown and uh, not a lot of friends were around. I was, I was kind of alone. And uh, one morning I was bored. And so I went back to my high school. I went back to my high school just to look around um, look around at the old hangouts and, and, um, and just by looking at the locations, a lot of memories came back. This was when I was like 28 or 29. So just like, like 10 years after high school. And, um, so a lot of these memories I wanted to, um, I wanted to hold on to, I wanted to jog down. I started writing like little memory scenes like, oh, this is what happened here. I remember this, I remember that. And, and then, you know, after a while, I, was, I, I had pages and pages of stuff mm -hmm. um, of what, you know, what happened with, you know, my, my, my gang of friends. <laughs> and um, so it kind of started from there. And then, you know, I had all these notes. And then I, I remember um, it was getting close to the, the, the Taiwan uh, Screenplay Award. Uh, every year we have a Yo Liang Ju Di Sai, which is you know the Screenplay Award, and um, and I think it was, it was like two three months 
before the deadline. And, um, and so I thought, you know, Hey, maybe I'll just all that stuff. Maybe I could work that into a feature. Maybe I could work that into a, a story. Mm -hmm. Um, and so winds of September came from there. Um, I had to like throw in a couple of characters together, a uh, couple of friends together as one character. I mean, <laughs> our group of friends, our group of friends, we had a huge group. We, we had a group of 15 kids. Oh. Um, so that was like too much to tackle and I couldn't write all 15. So I was like putting together personalities that were similar into one character. Um, and then I ended up with, um, nine. Oh, did any of the kids in the film represent yourself? <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course, there's a kid that represents myself. Um, and it's funny because it's, 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 it's funny, I think, in retrospect, the character with the least personality <laughs> represents who I am. Oh. Um, just because, again, I'm not very reflexive of myself, mm -hmm. and I don't see how I'm special <laughs> in, in any way. But when I look at my other friends, I see their speciality. You know, he's the funny one. He's the good-looking one. He's the bad-tempered one. He's the, he's the soft-spoken one. You know, he's <laughs> the, he's the joker. You know, oh. I, like when I see all my friends, it's very easy to pinpoint their special personality but okay. it's hard to pinpoint my own and so yeah. the character that most represents me i think on screen is the most boring <laughs> it's just, i think that's that that's that's how it came to be yeah, yeah. is it is it tauren or which no come on he's he's more he has more personality no uh, uh, um, I think the one that most represents me is is the Zhang Jie character. Oh, yeah, oh. he doesn't really do much. I mean, he's kind of, he's quite boring. Um, we see we we see a lot of the story from his eyes, of course, but then he's quite boring. I think. <laughs> no, I think he's very interesting. That's why I haven't well, thought of. He's, he's interesting because Zhang Jie is interesting. I like Zhang Jie. I mean, I mean, he brings a lot to to the character. But the whole screenplay, I mean, once we casted the actors, we were also, you know, fitting, I guess, again, this is like, you know, Taiwan New Wave, they do that a lot. Um, we were fitting the story to the characters, I mean, to the actors. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had a certain sense of what the character should be like, but then these are non-actors. So when they come, they bring their own thing. And then when they have that thing, you, you utilize it. And then you say, okay, we'll go with this. We'll we'll make it more this way, we'll make it more that way to fit them, yeah. All right. Um, and their, their friendship on screen, that's real. Mm. That was real. That was, that was us um, training for three months. Um, and um, so they were training for three months. They knew each other for three months. They got to be friends. They got to hang out. And, right. and then for them, it was like summer vacation, you know, it was like summer camp. They went off. <laughs> summer camp they all went to my hometown they all lived in a hotel um and uh, uh and and they were having a great time they were having a blast hanging out with each other just being friends and uh and and and, and we captured that we captured that on 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 film um mm. yeah yeah we were fortunate yeah great um yeah i think oh i think max is also very interested in your latest work uh, which is um, the the Garden of Evening Mist. Ah, yes. So, um, so Max is wondering what the competition was like um, amongst the Japanese actors for the role of um, Nakamura Aritomo. So um, he think you you cast Hi Hiroshi Abe um, for the role, and he said it suits it very well. Um, and he he's asking because um, he imagines. Um, someone else, such as uh, Watanabe Ken, could also have been a popular choice um, as a similarly brooding, mysterious presence. Yes, of course. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So, how how did you work on that? Well, um, I think when I'm when I'm casting, um, 
I'm I'm quite rebellious when I'm casting, or or you could see it another way where when I'm casting I'm casting as uh, a very often moviegoer. Mm -hmm. um, I watch a lot of movies. I'm a cinephile. Um, I watch I, and I watch everything too, not just art films. You know, I watch uh, commercial movies too, and I enjoy them a lot. And so I'm very familiar with um, the usual suspects of mm. Japanese actors that could oh. play an English-speaking role. Right. Um, <clears throat> and and so I didn't want to go the obvious. That was the that was that was my idea because as an audience, I didn't really want to see that anymore. You know, it's like <laughs> like every. Every English speaking Japanese role is played by the same actors. It's just, <laughs> there's only a handful of actors or actresses, and it's just them. And I was kind of like, well, well, you know, like when it, when I'm an audience, I would say, like, you know, like, can't you guys give me something else? So as a filmmaker, I get the opportunity to do that. I get the opportunity to do. Let's give him something else. Let's give him some other actor that nobody would think would probably do this or would be able to do this. Yeah. Um, we, 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 I mean, we got, again, I, I got pretty lucky with Hiroshi Abe. Um, I mean, I loved him. Um, like, even before, you know, even before he, he, he did his, he started doing the Koreeda movies. Uh, mm -hmm. I was a big fan of, of him already. Um, in television series, um, and uh, and loved him even more when he, you know, when I saw him in Still Walking by Coriata. Oh. Um, oh, that just that was a heartbreaking movie. Oh, so great. Um, so yeah, so I didn't even know if Hiroshi Abe spoke English or if he was interested in doing an English-speaking role. I had no idea. But I pitched it to um, the film company and I said, you know, would we want to approach Hiroshi Abe and, and see? And um, I mean, what's the worst what's the worst thing that could happen? He says no, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, that's no loss on our end. So let's try it. So that's that's what we did. You know, I, I wrote a very long letter to Mr. Abe mm. and um, and explained to him why. I saw him as um, the role of Nakamura Haritomo and, uh, and invited him and wished that he could come play this role. And um, yeah, and, I, and again, I, like I said, lucky that he was in, uh, I mean, in his career, he was at a point in his career where he, he wanted to try that, where mm -hmm. he wanted to try something new he wanted to go abroad. Um, he wanted, and he had a good experience working with Chen Tai Ge ah. in China oh. with on, on Yao Mao Zhuan. So he had a good experience doing that, working with a Chinese crew. And so he figured, well, another opportunity in Malaysia, English, and then like everything kind of like spoke to him and said that this is a good challenge, yeah. and uh, and he took it. So he was actually. He was the first Japanese actor that we approached, and he said yes. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were very lucky, yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, I think um, B, you mentioned that she had another question, oh. but she didn't have the chance to, <laughs> to yeah. say it. So would you like to come yes. on stage? Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. It's such a... Great Q and A. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Um, no, no, no uh, problem. <laughs> um, I would like to ask you something really reflecting uh, the series, really, because what we wanted to do, as we said uh, at the beginning, mm. really trying to figure out what is what happened next after New Wave. Uh, you know, mm. so mm -hmm. as one of the younger generation directors, would you say that you're influenced by the we have? You have talked about it, but can you uh, elaborate a little bit about how you are influenced and who you think you take away most? And what's the big, biggest difference between your generation, as you said, 
in the circle from those uh, before you? What's the difference? Ah, oh, wow, that's that's a great question. Um, well, I mean, a, a lot of filmmaking methods were very influenced by the new wave. Um, realism, um, a social importance. When we do our own work, we actually, we ask ourselves, you know, is there social importance in this, in this, in this work? Is this speaking to the community that we live in? Um, uh, the naturalism that we try to go for, um, minimalism in, in a way, you know, we, you know, we feel guilty when we're using music, you know, it's like, you look, you know, like, yeah, we do. I mean, you, you know, there was a, you know, there was a time where it's like, oh, should we be using so much music? It's getting, <laughs> it's starting to feel melodramatic. They wouldn't oh. do this, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah. So, um, and then of course, I think also like, you know, how a lot of our professors, when they're talking about the new wave, they talk about, you know, how they were do how they were coming up with, with what they were doing and what they were fighting for. Um, so it, it all, it's all, it, it all impacts us. Um, and, um, uh, and so like, like, you know, like I said, you know, for, for me, Winds of September was probably my most Taiwan new wave film. Um, from, from the choice of actors to the locations, I was going back to my hometown to make the film. Um, I was, I was, and the, the whole baseball scandal that mm -hmm. happened in the year, in, in 1997, um, was also a, a, a very important backdrop for the story. Um, I mean, all that was coming from the tradition of the new wave. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, if the, I think the one difference from that our generation has from, from the, their generation was, um, we were losing something to fight against. Um, so we had to start looking internally. Um, I mean, because we were growing up in the 80s and 90s, we were growing up after, you know, after the end of martial law. We were growing up in a post uh, Taipei that was not, you know, that heavily controlled by the government. We weren't, we didn't grow up being censored. Uh, we didn't grow up with people telling us we can't say this, we can't say that. Um, we didn't have that, um, we didn't have that fire in us to, to rebel against something. So we were just rebelling. So it, in a way I do see, in a way I do see the post, uh, the post new wave as these, these rebels without a cause a little bit. Um, we're trying to find something to, to fight for and fight against but we're not quite sure of what that is. And so we just look at ourselves um, and we look at what has influenced us and, and, and what, you know, and, and I also think we're not as ambitious. Um, I think we do feel that we, I don't know. I, I I can't I can't speak for my whole my entire generation. Sure. Um, but when I speak for myself, is I felt that I had more to lose, um, because I was I was growing up. I mean, it's, I'm not like you know, I'm not like in a rich family or anything like that. You know, but I grew up quite you know privileged. I was in a middle class family. I didn't have to worry too much about money, and um, and you know. Uh, you know, I didn't have, you know, I, I, you know, I did a lot of part-time jobs and had to make money for myself sometimes, but I wasn't like starving and I wasn't, um, there, there really wasn't that, that thing there that, I don't know, that creates the artist. I'm not sure. 
Uh, and I think because our generation kind of grew up like that, we kind of grew up in a very stable environment. And that stability speaks, I think, in our our films. There's something in it that um, that's just not the same. That's that's that that is a little. I don't want to use the word meek, but <laughs> but that's 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 more calming, or or that's you know, there's just yeah. Oh. Oh, I don't know. You know it's a is good it, question. Uh, because um, although you you have no uh, authoritarian uh, regime to fight, mm. however, there are plenty of other kind of enemy. For example, like commercial interests. There's another uh, uh, factor is the China factor. So sometimes people do have find their own enemies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's well. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, yeah, but but the but the surrounding that we were in was made us feel quite safe, mm. and um, so it's it's in a way like you know the safer you feel, the less you know what you want to say. Um, and then you have to go back to a a, a time where. Maybe something was being fought, or um, maybe there was something there, um, which kind of explains, you know, like Yang Yaozi's uh, uh, girlfriend boyfriend mm. um, setting the film back to the 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 uh, the, the uh, Ye Bai He era, the mm. student um, movement, um, because you know at that time they were fighting for something. Um, yeah, yeah. Can I also ask about Zinnia Flower? Yes, sure, of course. Uh, it, it's such a, a mature film in comparison to this coming of age sort of uh, winds of September. It's almost a seeing your own growth when you talk about autobiographical <laughs> sort of a nature. Um, can, because actually all your films feels Apart from *Senior Flower*, it feels quite a men's film, a male's perspective. Uh, for example, okay. uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example, *Pain of Others* is is a kind of like a collective memory among all the Taiwanese men. Oh, uh, great. This kind yes. of experience, yes. but um, yes, yes. *Senior Flower* is very mature, very understated in comparison to your other films. So. Could you talk a little bit about this particular film? I know it's a personal tragedy, but at the same time, how to transfer a personal experience to an artistic work is there are quite a lot of a uh, 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 process going through. Could you discuss? Just tell us a little bit about it. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, Zenia Flower came out of. I mean, it was my catharsis. Um, it was something I needed to do to move on. Um, to if I wanted to to make any more films, I needed to to, to make Zinnia Flower. That's I had the very, very strong feeling that I had to do that. Um, I didn't know quite w what I wanted to do, or even if I wanted to do it, or um, if I, I was able to go through it. Um, so a lot of conscious choice when I was making that film was made. Um, was made just to finish it, basically. Um, like I, I didn't care about how it was going to be perceived. I didn't care about where people are going to see it or what's it going to look like. I just needed to make it, and I needed to go through it, um, go through the process of making it. Um, and so, like. Um, for that film, I particularly, with the exception of the DP, because the previous DP that I chose had uh, other stuff and then he, he had to drop out. Um, so with the exception of the DP, everybody else on that film has never worked with me before and, and does not know my wife. Um, and that was a conscious decision on my part. I did not want anybody near me 
reminding me of what I'm already doing. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of weird. Um, but so in, in a sense, it's, it's my purest film because I was making it for no other reason than the, the reason of I need to finish this. I need to just get this out of my system and tell it um, this, is, this is the grief that I went through. This is the grief that a lot of people like me go through. Nobody talks about this grief. Nobody shows this kind of grief in this rawness, in this sense. And, and I wanted to do that. Um, so yeah, that was, yeah. And then, you know, I made it, um, so at the same time while I was making it, um, I was making all sorts of compromises, just knowing that it's not going to be a film that's going to be very commercial. It's not going to be a film that are going to be rushing to see, um, it might lose money for the financers and I need to. Um, I need to, you know, find ways for them to feel safe about their 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 money, and um, and so more. I think a a lot of the financing came from sponsorships and fundings. Um, we had the Taiwan Film Grant. Uh, we had uh, grants from different cities. Uh, Gao Xiong said they were willing to give me a grant, so I wrote and then I changed the screenplay to Gao Xiong. Um, <laughs> Okay. Uh, Taoyuan, Taoyuan gave me some money, so I found the temple in Taoyuan. Um, uh, Okinawa was 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 um, was willing to sponsor us with the Okinawa shoot shooting part. Um, with um, so to give the production to give the Okinawa production company co-producer credit, um, they went and got their sponsorship. Um, so I was, yeah, it was it, like, I was, I was choosing a lot of these locations just based on who's giving me money to do this. Who's going to give me some grants that I don't have to pay back and I'll work it that way. I'll work it there. I'll, I'll go here to do it. I'll go there to do it. That's kind of how the, I mean, I had a story, but then all these locations, I was just like fitting mm -hmm. it left and right, just because that's where the money was coming from. Um, and yes, yeah, so I was working with a lot of limitations in that sense. Uh, um, but story-wise and what I wanted to do, I was just, one, I was free to do anything I wanted. And two, I didn't really care. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, it's, 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 yeah. In a way, you could say it's my most selfish work. Um, but... But that's kind of how it came about. Um, and the fact that it actually found an audience, that people were touched by the film. I think I got more responses from Xenia Flower than any of my movies. Um, people were writing to me. Um, people were messaging me. Um, Sometimes they were thanking me. Sometimes they were just telling me their story of what they went through, of who they lost. Um, and um, yeah, and so so it turned out to be um, it, it turned out to be quite quite the experience. Yeah. So it is really not selfish film. It is a personal film. I, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> and. Um, um, can you also explain a little bit about this film that uh, why it's a paralleled uh, emphasis? So uh, someone lost their wife and uh, his wife and his one lost the husband and going through the process, um, they cope differently. Yes. Um, that that I, I was actually inspired by something that actually happened to me. Um, it was true. Um, after my, my, after my wife passed away, um, I was, there was, th there's a period of time where, you know, I would go to the, 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 the being equal. What do you call that in English? The morgue? Yes. It's not the morgue. It's the, it's the, it's not the cemetery either. What is it? No. Um, morgue? yeah, I mean, it's 
it's it's the morgue cemetery. It's 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 you know where where people. It's not like they're there, but then we have like incense and spirit and mm. boards and stuff like that for them. And um, so after my wife passed away, you know, a lot of friends came to light an incense for her. And so I was there for for many many days. I was just doing nothing. Like in the morning, I get up, I go there. I knew that friends were becoming. And I would show them where uh, my wife is. They would light an incense. And then they would go. They would chat with me. Um, and I was there for a couple of days. Um, and then one day I saw this woman uh, bawling. She, was, she, she came and she was crying so hard that her family had to carry her. She couldn't even walk. Um, I didn't know who she lost. Um, but... Uh, um, but she was very devastated by the loss, and, and then and so and so I, I remember so you know that struck me. I was like I saw her and I was like wow she's so sad. She's like she's really really sad, um, and and um, and it made an impression. Um, and because my wife's Buddhist, so like the movie, you know, I would do the the, the every seven day ritual, the seven seven seventy. The forty-nine with ritual, um, and and on that seventh day, when I went up to the temple, and then we had the mass, um, the, the the mass, uh, um, the, the, the 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 mass prayer, I saw her again. This time, of course, she's calmer. She's a lot calmer this time. But then I saw this woman again, and. Um, and it immediately struck me that with her being here on the seventh day, we lost somebody on the same day. Mm. Like, you know, logically, that's how you do the math. That's, that's, we lost somebody on the same day. And then for the next couple of weeks, every seven days, I, I would see her. I would see her there um, praying uh, for the person that she lost. Um, and I, I never talked to her um, or anything like that. It was, it was nothing like the movie. We never really, we never talked or anything. But then on the hundredth, and then I forgot about her. Like after the 49th day, you know, I went on with my life, of course, and then I was struggling. I was dealing with a lot of things, moving um, her will, all that stuff. And then on the 100th day, while I was going up the mountain, I thought of that woman again. Oh. And I and I thought like, wow, it, like all of a sudden I was like, it was just, it just struck me like, oh, will she be there? Will she will she also come for the 100th day ceremony? Because not a, not everybody does it. A lot of not a lot of people choose just to do the 49 and that's it. Um so I was thinking, like, wow, is she going to be there? Is she, am I actually going to see her again? Um, and, it, it, and out of, I guess, just out of curiosity, I wanted to know what she went through. Like, how did she spend her 100th day? Um, but I didn't see her. Um, at the last uh, prayer, I didn't see her. But it got me thinking. It got me thinking about other people. It got me thinking about dealing with grief. It got me thinking about how other people deal with grief. Um, and again, and it's not just her. It's like when you go do this thing, everybody around you has lost somebody dear to them. And they're all praying for them at the same time. And, um, and we probably lost them at the same time. Um, and, and so there's a connection to that. And then I wanted to tap into that connection of these strangers that has this common thing, uh, a common tragedy that happened to them. And, um, and it was, it was, I think it was on that day that I started writing the story on the hundredth day. I came, I came back home. And I started writing. I started writing this idea of two people um, going through same thing in a very, very different way. Yeah. Thank you.
um, thanks for sharing this with us. No, no, no problem. And there seemed to be a, a, a slight social commentary or criticism about a different way of uh, uh, facing death. Um, there's a Christian approach and uh, a Buddhist approach. Mm -hmm. And I did find it very interesting to see the contrast. Can you talk a little bit about it? Oh, that, that, was, that, was, that was just inspired by what my friend went through. Oh. Um, my friend went through a similar thing where the two families had different religious backgrounds and they wanted different kinds of ceremonies and they got into a, a quite a big argument um <laughs> about that and i always thought that was i always thought that was um kind of ridiculous just because anything that we do is more for the living than for the dead and um and so it doesn't really matter what you do as long as you're comfortable with it, that's fine. Um, why fight that? You know, mm. um, if 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 it's if they feel more comfortable doing a Christian thing, then let's do a Christian thing. If it's more comfortable as a Buddhist thing, let's do a Buddhist thing. Um, it it probably doesn't really matter that much to the person that passed away. You know, <laughs> it's a, yeah. Um, but I always thought that was kind of like that was kind of interesting. So I put that into in the story, yeah. yeah. It's um, quite, a, quite a interesting, almost like social commentary in a mm, way. Yeah, a little, little bit, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, may I ask Xiaoyi, is there any more uh, question there? Um, I do think Eleanor has a question, um, but I'm not quite sure if I understand her question. Um, so Elena is asking um, if the new new wave cinema is already a corporation. Um, maybe Elena, would you like to elaborate on your question? The new wave cinema a corporation. What does that mean? Well, it was it was actually helped by a corporation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was helped by a company called CMPC. It kind of pushed this whole Taiwan New Wave thing. Um, I, I don't know if that answers anything um, regarding okay. the New Wave. Mm. Okay. So if Eleanor's not coming in to uh, ask that question, maybe uh, we should wrap it up. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Um, it's a fantastic uh, um, session because, you know, this is really real treat for us. Um, oh, you see people already saying thank you. Oh, perfect ending, really. Uh, it's uh, fascinating. Um, you know, we'll talk about more or less cover all the films uh, we're showing uh, this week. Thank you all for taking part in the first, uh, I mean, the second uh, director Q&A session. May I ask you again to switch on your uh, uh, microphone? Really, this time you sh you owe Tom his uh, a round of applause. Okay. No, thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you.